So I'm very excited to be here. You all do have a lot going on, and can I tell you how many folks in other cities are super jealous that you have funding from your city? That is not normal. Just in case you all thought that was normal, it's not normal. There's a handful in the whole country that do that. So you have, you have a lot of things others don't have. Um, and I didn't even bother to put this in the slides, but it occurred to me as I'm here today with you all, you all have this. Most cities don't. I live in Columbus, Ohio. I have trouble figuring out who else is doing digital inclusion related work. We don't know each other. You all know each other. That seems so simple, but it is so valuable. You have money from the city. You have ways to talk to each other. It's just awesome. Uh, so I am here from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we started NDIA about five years ago because there wasn't a voice nationally for the work that you all are doing. Um, so we define it as uh, the public access, the home access of the internet, the digital literacy skills, and access to devices. So in order to narrow down what we are doing and how we're, who we're representing, that's our focus. The affiliates, we're, we created ourselves as an affiliate-based entity. We thought if we're going to, and it came totally out of those BTOP pro projects, right? So, um, which you all were part of. When we started NDIA, it was because decisions were being made in DC, and they had no idea that programs like yours existed. Like, they just, they just didn't. Like, there's still lots of folks who don't. Because there's a perception that everybody's like us. Everybody's like me. Right? So especially if you're doing public policy work, those who are making the policy sometimes, oftentimes, always, need to be reminded that everyone is not like them. There are folks who don't have access to the internet. There are folks who don't have digital skills. There are folks who don't have devices. And we have to create policies around that, and we need funding for it. We'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, so our affiliates, we have about 400 affiliates. Uh, we are all over the US. And it is very much a grassroots kind of effort. Digital inclusion in the United States is local. Y'all know there's no federal money. We're working on that. But there's no, there's no federal money. There's no federal um, guidance of any kind. It is local. It is the work you all are doing. So what we do is gather together the folks who are doing that work and uh, learn from them in order to represent you when we're trying to get things done nationally and federally. Um, so who doesn't have internet? Uh, the data that we use most often is the American Community Survey data. Um, it, is an, it is finally now available at a more granular level than it has been available. Some of the resources that we have available to you are the resources that have to do with maps. So on our website, as Juliet said, go look at digitalinclusion.org. There's a lot there that is intended to assist you, including maps. So the numbers that we use most often are 20 million uh, households in the United States do not have internet at home of any kind, including mobile phones. So you all hear this too, right? Like, everybody has access to the internet, right? So here's the big number that you can use nationally, 20 million. In DC right now, and even in some communities, there's a big focus on rural access, that the infrastructure isn't there. The infrastructure is there in urban areas, and 15 million of those 20 million households. <laughs> don't, I think that's totally adorable. Um, don't have access. <laughs> it's not for me. So, um, <laughs> so of the 20 million, 15 million are in urban areas. We can just wait. It's good. So. Um, those folks, the infrastructure's there, so why don't they have internet, right? You all know the reasons. It's expensive, digital literacy skills, uh, devices. So part of what we do is help with the awareness around that issue, right? We help with the awareness and understanding that, yes, making sure that we build out physical infrastructure in rural areas is really important, but we can't stop there, and we can't even wait for that to happen before we make sure folks are actually adopting it. That's kind of dumb. The important, I think there's slides missing. Um, so an important piece between that is the income. So of the folks who don't have access to that 20 million, the largest portion is, is poverty, right? It's lowing, it's, it's the not being able to afford it. So an, a 
there are lots of complicated reasons that folks don't have access to the internet, and you all know that. But if you need to simplify it for folks, which in my position I often need to do get some, to get someone's attention, we will simplify it based upon poverty. So if it, the internet is expensive, you don't have it. If, you, if there's a lack of digital skills, why would you pay for something expensive if you're not really sure how to use it? That's dumb too. So the solution is what you all are doing, right? Um, the work that NDIA does is to represent and support your work. And I can tell you, the conversation is changing. I am less likely to have to now explain that it is necessary, and I'm more likely to be having a discussion of how. That's actually a big deal. That, because that, and I was getting pretty tired of <laughs> explaining why it was necessary. But now we can jump right into how do we do it, which is not always an easy answer, right? It can be very complicated. If, for example, who pays for it? Nobody wants to pay for it, right? But folks do need to pay for it. One of the so when NDIA got started, one of the first things we did is create definitions of digital inclusion and digital equity. Because we ourselves, I, was using the two terms interchangeably, and then others would call me on it. And I'd be like, well, I actually don't know the difference. So we formed a working group and determined what is that difference based, everything we do, is based upon work on the ground like yourselves around the country. So digital equity, that's the goal. This is where we want to get to. That individuals and, communi and communities both have the information communication technologies they need for full participation. Definitely missing slides. The one after that is digital inclusion definition, which is, that, which is the how. This is, what, this, this is the work, right? This is the folks that, what folks are doing. This is getting folks access to public access internet. This is getting folks access at home. This is finding affordable and appropriate devices for the task, because y'all know mobile phones do not always cut it. And it's digital literacy skills. And that digital literacy is a continuum, because all of us, never done. <laughs> never done with digital literacy. So of course, the work that we do teaching digital literacy, also never done. I hate to tell you, but job security, if you can raise the money for it, which is another issue. So the, the support that we provide, there's the policy work, and then there's the peer-to-peer -peer network stuff. So the peer-to-peer -peer network is getting all of our folks to talk to each other. So what we are nationally is what you are locally, right? So NDIA is all of you at a national level. And it's all the variety that, which is in this room, which is awesome. It was super fabulous to hear Andrew explaining the, who has the grants, because that was a really great representation of the serving different populations. Same thing with NDIA nationally. It is a large group of folks from different areas. Our, our affiliates tend to be libraries, housing authorities, nonprofits, and local governments. I can tell you the two surprises to that. We thought it was going to be local, we thought it was going to be nonprofits and libraries. The surprise first was local governments, because they just kind of kept showing up to stuff. And that was awesome, because they have resources, and they have connections. So we were like, yes, 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 come on in. And then the other surprise was housing authorities. When uh, HUD started their Connect Home program, I said, that's dumb, there's no money. I was wrong. It's incredibly popular, and it really is working. <laughs> So those are the four that tend to participate within NDIA. So from that group, uh, we have a small staff. I think we're at like 3.4 or something like that. We learn from, and we use a lot of volunteers, we learn from our folks in the field. So we created these guidebooks. So these are all on the website. So there's a digital inclusion startup manual. This is for when you need to talk to someone about the basics of what it is that digital inclusion is. You hand them this. Or if you want to look at what the other options are, like right now we're only doing digital literacy, maybe we should look at devices or the discount internet options. It's all in there. The discount internet guidebook was created specifically because there are discount internet, like internet essentials and others, that are for the most part underutilized. I was talking to Bob earlier and I'm like, I suspect, I would love to figure, see some data on this, but I suspect that because you all have TLC and talk to each other, and you have Bob hanging out with you, that Internet Essentials is probably more utilized in this Philadelphia area than in other areas. 
because whoever the Bob is in other places doesn't have this. So I suspect that they're probably not as aware of the resource as you all are. Um, the, the other one that we have is a Digital Inclusion Coalition's guidebook, which representative from TLC participated in the creation of that guidebook. Big surprise, right? Because you all have this coalition to talk to each other. Digital Inclusion Trailblazers is our honor roll of local governments doing digital inclusion work. Yes, Philadelphia is on the honor roll. <laughs> um, it is a set of indicators that, do, that are asking whether or not the city is doing certain things around digital inclusion. Does the city have staff working on digital inclusion? Does the city have funding for digital inclusion? Does the city have, um, does the city conduct research around digital inclusion? Does the city participate in a coalition? There's a variety of these. Are there free Wi-Fi, right? We have like this whole list of things. We're currently updating it because just as I'm not being asked as much about if it's, if it's important for everyone to have access, I'm also, we're also changing and we're becoming more complex. What we all do is becoming more complex. And so we now have folks at varying levels of engagement. So we now have cities who are just tipping in to digital inclusion work, and we have cities who have been doing it. Seattle's been doing it for 18, 19 years. They were the first city to have full-time staff. They actually have like multiple staff, which still blows me over. Very few places have multiple staff. Just focused on digital inclusion. So our conference is um, April 7th to the 9th in Portland. We welcome you to join us, of course. Um, the way NDIA operates is that we have individuals participating in all of our working group efforts. So what we create, we create for and with our, our members, our affiliates. Some of the policy work that we're doing right now, the Digital Equity Act is in the House and the Senate, and it is intended to fund your work around digital inclusion. Will we get it passed? I don't know. When we started NDIA, um, I had zero policy experience. That was five years ago. So I didn't get into this because I knew what I was doing. I get into it because I believed in what I was doing. I suspect you all are in that same boat. You believe in what you're doing. So we will continue to push forward looking for funding for you, and we do it in different areas in the federal government. And now we're looking at what the states are doing because there's activity there. Super exciting. And as mentioned, all the surprises of the local government around what local governments are doing. So I welcome you to join NDIA. I welcome you to engage you in our efforts. Um, some fun kind of slides now, just to let you know that you are not alone around the country, right? These are some of our affiliates. Some of them are cities. Some of them are nonprofits like Free Geek. Some of them are housing authorities. Some of them are nonprofits focused entirely on digital inclusion. Those are super rare. This might be my favorite photo. <laughs> what would you do for Wi-Fi? Would you lug your PC or get your mom to drop it off so you could sit outside the library for their internet? Okay, I think we're good for questions. Yes, in the back. Yes, so, that's a good question. Yes. So, and also, may I have uh, a copy of this uh, PowerPoint so I can look at it later? Yes, absolutely. So, yes, um, the populations that we serve are the populations doing the digital inclusion work. So, that definitely includes those organizations that are working on helping those with disabilities get access to the internet and know how to use it. I didn't. Um, we, one of the reasons that we don't, we are 3.4 staff, we limit our focus on the poverty issue. And, and most people with disabilities are in the poverty sector. Agreed. And so at the conference and in, the, in our um, community are those working. In fact, 
what we've tried to do, so we have a, only a few organizations that focus entirely on those with disabilities. It's more that our members work with the other organizations to make sure that anyone that comes in the door gets the help that they need. So at the conference, there's always a session to educate our members because not all of them are working with disabled populations, but some of them want to be ready. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How often have you been hosting that conference? Like how many years? How big is it? Yeah. Yeah, right. So this will be our fifth year in Portland. Uh, we started out in Kansas City. We keep moving it around. Last year we were in Charlotte. Uh, we're expecting about 350 people. The folks that attend are the, f are the same as our affiliate base, which is the nonprofits, uh, libraries, housing authorities, and local governments. And then there are those who are also advocates and support for them. So other national organizations, some federal government folks, um, internet service providers, it is a um, it is a mix of all of them. Yes, sir. Are you um, a uh, uh, follow on to CTCNet? <laughs> yes, actually, I was the board president of CTCNet back in the day. Yeah, CTCNet was the, a national organization. They did not survive over time, and so yes, you could say we are the next iteration. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, hi. Could you um, elaborate a little bit more about the Digital Equity Act? Um, yeah. How did you get there, and what are your next steps um, yes. as far as policy? Right. So as with most of our work, we got there through local affiliates. The, the city of Seattle was engaged with Senator Murray from the state of Washington, and sh her and her staff were creating the Digital Equity Act. They brought us in, so we had a chance to edit what it looked like. Um, it is about funding uh, digital equity plans at the state level, and it is about then funding organizations at the local level that would be um, competitive. So whether or not that particular legislation comes through, I you know, can't see the future, but the, the possibility of getting some kind of funding and having it go through the states, I suspect, is on the horizon. So I think the way to prepare for that is to know who else is doing work in the state and talking to your state broadband office and others at the state because you would definitely not want them creating a plan without you. That was a good question. Other questions? Tell me if I see a hand. Yes. I'll ask a question. Um, and with the change in the FCC and the way that they're showing uh, they're, they're checking on broadband access using mobile phones now, saying, saying that that is the internet access if you have a mobile phone. How has that affected your work? Yeah, so um, we argue with the FCC a lot. I mean, we talk to the FCC <laughs> a lot. Um, when we first started NDIA, um, the FCC was modernizing Lifeline, which is the phone, um, Obama phones are often known as, right? So it's a phone <laughs> subsidy. Um, and that now does include broadband, but folks still need phones. Um, the current FCC defines broadband differently than we would define broadband. Um, they include satellite service, and they like to include mobile phones, uh, which all have data caps. So we do engage with them. We are one of the entities that submits comments to them so that we're on the public record. We engage with other entities who are then talking to the FCC. I don't know that we're going to get the current FCC to change their minds, but we'll keep engaging so that we can work towards that. Um, and then if there's a different lead, a different chair at the FCC, we may have some different opportunities, particularly because we will have kept submitting those comments and been ready. Um, for example, the definitions we have of digital inclusion and digital equity have been cited by the FCC, have been cited by other federal agencies. That's the kind of awareness building that we are doing for you, right? Like that's that's what we exist to do. Yes. So you mentioned Bob and then Essentials earlier. They're a national company, obviously, they're Philadelphia based. Right. But like I don't hear stuff from Verizon or 
other large yes. providers. Right. Are they doing this? Or are you lobbying them to do it? Yeah, right. They're or not they doing it. Bob is awesome and they suck. Um, <laughs> Bob, Bob is awesome. Um, and how does that look like? What, yeah, right. So that, that's a great question. So Charter does have a discount internet offer. Um, so Charter Spectrum, $15 a month, 30 meg. It's actually pretty good. Um, but there's... A, all of these, and AT&T has one too, theirs is um, five or ten, depending upon, five or ten dollars, depending upon the speed you have coming into your house. They, they all have different populations that are eligible. Hurrah to Internet Essentials for opening it up and having it be a, a much larger population that is eligible. The others have not done that yet. We have high hopes. Um, Verizon does not have a discount internet offer. They do put money into middle schools. That's good. I wish they had a discount internet offer. They know that I wish they had a discount internet offer. I don't know that I'm gonna get one anytime soon. Um, NDIA has an interesting relationship with internet service providers. Uh, I feel like it's an honest relationship. So um, when they do something that we think is not in the best interests of the populations that we serve, we call them out on it. And I tell them I'll give them a day's notice. I think that's fair. They come to the conference. They don't give us very much money. 10 grand here, 15 grand there, right? So it's just enough for them to stay within our community, but for that, them to not influence the work that we do. Um, probably the one we have um, the most challenging relationship with is AT&T, because we, were said, we said they were digitally redlining. They are, and I'll still say it again. They have not rolled out their newer infrastructures in low-income areas. It's on maps. It's their data. I'm definitely not making this stuff up. So um, the relationship I've had with some of the other providers is they say, we're a little worried you might say something. I'm like, well, don't do anything dumb. <laughs> and then everybody's going to be solid, right? <laughs> um, so I think we have to have a bigger solution. The discount internet is a great Band-Aid. It is just a Band-Aid. If you're not eligible, and there are lots of folks who are eligible for Internet Essentials, there are a bunch of folks who still aren't. You make a dollar over, <laughs> right? And then you're not eligible for certain services, and then you're not eligible for the discount Internet. It's still really expensive to get Internet. So we have a problem with expensive Internet in the United States. So we have to deal with that both through increased competition locally and through subsidies. I hate it, I know people don't like to hear that, but look, that's the reality. We have to make sure everyone has internet at home, and right now, we are not doing that in the United States. We're band-aiding it. Yes, sir. Um, what about the presence of um, presidential hopefuls? Is this even on their radar? Um, have you been approached by any of these? I have, okay. yeah, and it is on at least two of their radar because I've talked to, to two from, from two places. Um, we're working on more, because our theory is, of course, cover your bases. Um, their radar, before we talked to them, was all rural. We're, because that's the conversation in DC. This is me banging my head on a table, right? Um, Yes, there are lots of folks who do not have physical infrastructure in rural areas of the United States. But there are even more folks who there is physical infrastructure available, but yet they still don't have broadband in their homes. They're not, it's not a, they don't have the subscription. So that's the message that we are taking to them. The other message is we have got to fix this subsidy issue. Lifeline as both a phone and a broadband subsidy but you can only have one service, and if you choose phone, right now it currently comes with two gig of data. Okay, that's, in, that's, that's just dumb also. That's insufficient, right? So the, our message is there's got to be two separate subsidies. I know y'all don't want to talk about they're putting more money on the table, but we've got to put more money on the table. It's just real quick, so that money comes from my bill. That, yeah, it is, a not, it is a complicated method. It is the Universal Service Fund, which comes from long, mostly long distance phone service. So on your bill, you will see Universal Service Fund fee. A tiny bit of it goes to Lifeline phones. 
The rest of it goes to paying for E-rate, which is for schools uh, and libraries, and then the rest of it goes to um, building, well, some of it goes for health institutions, um, getting internet, and then the rest of it is for building out infrastructure in rural areas. That's where most of your, that fee goes. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, you know, I think that something that, that we've been talking a lot about is, and you mentioned this in the beginning, is, you know, there's the issue of one, access, which is like, how are we getting people connected? Yeah. Um, and then there's the issue, too, of like, once people are connected, how are we making sure that they really know how to use tech and, and right. be connected in the ways that are the most helpful and up to date and that sort of thing? Can you talk a little bit more about kind of your strategies around that second part? You know, let's say we get to a point where everyone's connected. Yeah. Like, what, what then? Yeah, right. So um, the what then is digital literacy and digital skills. And so all, you all know, like, this is this huge continuum of basic digital literacy can you use email, right? Do you, do you know how to be safe on the internet? To all those middle skill jobs that are going unfilled, coding and other tech related jobs, right? There's that continuum in between there. So that is, that is a huge challenge. And there is another national coalition in the United States that has just formed around this issue to bring more attention to it because it hasn't gotten the attention that it needs. It, again, is very um, locally based. Uh, and it's very piecemeal, piece, piece, piece here, here. Um, even federal funding for workforce doesn't require digital skills, right? There was, we're still putting too much money into jobs that don't exist anymore. That just kills me. Uh, I was told that there, there's a large nonprofit that was doing workforce work, and they had to cut the budget, so they cut digital literacy. <laughs> don't cut digital literacy. But, but if there's no priority being placed on it, and there's not even a general understanding of what it is, then yes, of course, we're going to have problems with it. Um, the, the other piece of that, I think, is the frames that we put on it, which has to do with the why. Why do we need internet at home? Why do we need digital literacy skills? And then if you think about the whys, which you all know the whys, right? Health and education, workforce, et cetera, et cetera. Those are also the players that should be engaged in the solutions. So who benefits from people having internet access and knowing how to use it? Lots of folks benefit. And they should be part of the solution. So health, financial institutions, Right? That's beyond government and education. So for example, um, financial institutions are starting to pay attention now. They've always done financial literacy type of work. More of them have started to get engaged in digital inclusion, but they do it through the workforce lens. So what NDIA is trying to do is change that to a digital literacy lens. Why do you have to prove that somebody got a job and that's why you got money to teach them how to use the internet? They just needed to know how to use the internet, <laughs> right? There are so many things we all use the internet for and that we use the technology for that have nothing to do with our jobs. I talk to my kids' teachers, I bank, right? Yada, 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 I find deals online. So the more we can pull those institutions in, like financial institutions, like healthcare. So there's some really great research going on right now around the impact on health of who has access to the internet and who knows how to use it. Because here's a big surprise, we needed researchers to tell us this. You'll use your personal health record more if you have internet at home and digital literacy skills. It's ridiculous, but we did actually need researchers to tell us that because that's what we can take to those health institutions. Because again, if you, th if you have access to the internet and you think everybody's like you, then your head doesn't think about how people who don't have it are not using the tools you wanted them to use. So that's one of the things we'll, that NDIA shares. Our listserv is pretty active with, hey, here's some new research. We have a lot of academics engaged, which I always want more, right? <laughs> we need the academics because they help prove the work that we're doing. Yes. How does somebody become a member? Oh, or yes. How does somebody get your newsletter? Yes. So on the website, there's a join button. I actually, I think we changed it to get involved. Uh, 
we are a community. You can just get the newsletter if that's all you want. You can join the list server by getting up, becoming an affiliate. Um, at the last net inclusion, folks were using the word movement. I was like, oh my gosh, they're right. We are, this is a movement. And we just happen to be the place where it's occurring. But it was happening locally and organically. Nobody was telling folks to do it. Andy, you had a question. Can you talk a little bit about some of the sort of community studies that are out there, sort of the awareness versus supportability arguments for why people don't have it? Yeah, sure. So um, the awareness issue he's, at, he's talking about is that some folks believe that um, if you choose, if you don't have internet at home, or you're choosing not to internet, have internet at home because you just don't know it's valuable. Um, NDIA calls BS on that. Folks know it's valuable. Um, in the past, research said that it w that folks would like when they were doing a survey, right? That the surveys would come back with high numbers of folks who said, "Not, not, not of value to my life." I don't need it. Newer surveys say if you ask a follow-up question, oh, why don't you need it? Well, I can't afford it. Why do I need it if I can't, you know, like, that's dumb. Or the follow-up follow answer will be, I don't know how to use it. I don't need it because I don't know how to use it. Why would I pay something I don't know how to use? I'm not going to waste my money. So the research um, can be confusing if you don't dive into it. But we have the research that says, if you ask the follow-up questions, then you hear what you really needed to understand. And I also, the part of NDIA's value is that we do represent folks like yourselves. So we hear from you, and we hear what you're saying about the folks that you work with, and we hear from the, the folks who, are, who don't have internet at home. Those of who that we may disagree with regarding whether it's because folks think it's not valuable or it's because they can't afford it and don't have digital literacy skills, I suspect they're not talking to you. And that's why they don't understand and that they think it's more about the relevance issue. Because they're a little, they're sitting in a different place. Another question, I'm sorry. Yes? You, meant, you mentioned earlier that there was a coalition forming around digital literacy. Yes. The so they haven't announced yet. Okay. They'll be announcing in January, actually. So as that moves further along, NDIA is the route to pulling everybody into that. So, um, so that will happen soon. And it is exciting because we haven't had that yet. Yeah. Can you kind of tell me like one or two things that you're really excited that are going to happen or that you foresee happening in the near future? Like sort of what's this what's the like positive yeah. like you know where are we moving towards? Okay, I don't know that I can say what's definitely going to happen. I can say what we're working on and that I have my fingers crossed and we're working really hard. Um, the Community Reinvestment Act is going to be modernized for sure. Will it include that digital literacy is an allowable investment by financial institutions to count as, as Community Reinvestment Act if we're successful? Because then you won't have to put that wrapper of workforce development on something when you were really just teaching people how to use the internet. So that's one. Those presidential candidates, that's another one. Um, The part of the focus on rural comes from the current administration. You all know that. That's not a surprise, right? Um, so it is impacting our work. So as the next president is elected, we kind of think them as, as being so like far removed from us. But it does. Like it does impact your work, and it impacts my work. So as much as we can influence that now, we are trying to do that to make sure that the digital inclusion issues in both urban and rural areas are represented equally. 
when I hear the term urban versus rural, I just want to scream. There's no versus. Look, we are all people, and we all need all of our resources to do this all together so we can all be healthy, happy, right? So as much as we can continue to bring folks together, that's, that's one of the other things that we're working on, right? We're getting rid of the verses as much as we can so that we can talk about both and then have resources for both. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, okay, good point. Um, so yes, they are all engaged. And um, I really did have slides missing. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Some terrible technology gremlin. Um, so yes, so the universities are, so I overheard some of Temple's, or I got to listen in on some of Temple's um, work today. That also is pretty unique. The amount of work that they are doing, is the, temple, is the folks from Temple still here? Awesome. Uh, had not, that is not common either. You all have so much that is unique here. Um, that's fabulous. The universities that, that are more engaged in the work tend to be from the research side. Research that also isn't ivory tower research, which is still really valuable. But there's a difference between research that goes out and works with the community and just working with the community, right? Which is what you're doing. So um, definitely want to get you to the conference <laughs> because our role is to show where the models are. So you're a model that we would love to have others following. And probably once we lift you up, a couple of other universities are going to be like, we're doing that too. And I just don't know they exist. <laughs> that, is, that is entirely possible. That is probably like the caveat I should put on all this. NDIA is, um, we were created out of nothing, zero dollars, right? Like I was, I was consulting and then we were starting NDIA, it was a little crazy, because um, I wasn't getting paid for the NDIA work and neither there was are my affiliates. So um, as we pull this together, the affiliate base, that map that I showed you, it's all just come about because they heard about us, not because we actually went out and found anybody. So there is certainly more work going on around there that we haven't gathered up and it's definitely increasing. But I've been doing this work for 20 some years and um, it used to be that there was about six of us who talked to each other. That's an exaggeration. But right, there wasn't a big group. Now there are these coalitions like yours, probably in about 20 cities around the country, which I think that's kind of a small number. We should have more. But comparatively, it used to be zero, right? So we're making progress. So it's, it's a matter of finding all those different folks. It's finding the university folks. It's finding everybody. And what was the other population mentioned? Church. Churches, yes. So some of our affiliates are churches also. Right. It's often churches that have a nonprofit arm attached to them where they do social service work. That's usually where it happens. Um, but back when I started this work 20 years ago, church basements were like the thing we would talk about because that's where technology training was happening 20 years ago. It was happening in church basements. Yes, ma'am. I'm a doctoral student at Penn, and I study social inequalities in the literacy. I feel like while the survey studies are great, we also need to see more qualitative studies to really yes. understand how this is affecting our communities and looking at, like, kind of from a more broader qualitative perspective, like how the work you're all doing is really influencing people um, in low-income communities and really in elsewhere. Yes, absolutely. And we do have some of that. Um, Colin Ryan Smith's works is probably the one that we cite the most often. Um, so the offer we make to academics is we are here. We'll help make connections. You're looking for a certain community that has a certain characteristics. We'll help you find it. Right? Like we want that work to happen. Last thoughts, questions, brilliant ideas to end us on a positive note. Okay, thank you all. I really appreciate being here. <laughs>